morning, Trinity. Thanks for joining us this morning. Won't you stand as we worship? Go ahead and have a seat. How good that we've gathered to worship a God who does, has done, and will do great things. Amen? Hey, welcome to Trinity uh, for our worship on this holiday weekend. I'm Paul. Uh, glad to have you with us, especially if you're new. So glad that you're here for this celebration and worship together. Uh, if you are new, we'd love to help you get connected with our Trinity family. And there's a couple ways that you can do that to take that next step. Uh, if you'd like, just take out your phone right now. You can text the word WELCOME to that number on the screen, 574-498-2140. 
and we'd love to help you connect that way. Or if you'd like, just fill out the little section on the bottom of your message notes, tear it off, and then leave it in the box as you exit. So ladies, our women's Bible studies this fall are beginning in just a couple weeks. And if you're looking for community, a place to go deeper, a place to find meaning in the, the passing pursuits of this life, you don't want to miss this study in Ecclesiastes. So to sign up, just text the word meaning to that number on the screen. And hey, speaking of groups, we're getting ready to launch season three of NT260. So you're not, if you're not currently in a group uh, and you'd like to be, we'd like you to join us for these final books and chapters in the New Testament. We've been journeying through the entire New Testament this year. Join us in a group. It's a great way to learn more about God's Word in community. You just need to text NT260 to that same number on the screen. And then in just three weeks, you don't want to miss September 25th, our Holy Sexuality Conference. Uh, it's going to feature Dr. Christopher Yuan, and he's going to share a gospel-centric approach to sexuality that really gives us a groundwork for understanding this issue, engaging with our culture, and especially loving our friends and family in the LGBTQ community. Uh, there's morning sessions, there's afternoon sessions, uh, it's free, there's child care, uh, so you can't miss in three weeks if you join us. But Space is limited, and I want to really emphasize this point. You need to register to get a seat. Uh, text the word HOLY to that number on the screen. Register today. Surf South Bend is coming up October 8th. This is a church-wide opportunity for us to express our love for the Lord, our love for our neighbors and our families and our communities. Uh, there's a lot of projects available that day, from landscaping to painting to prayer walks, a lot of other opportunities in between. Uh, you can check out more of those projects and uh, get more information by texting the word SERVE to the number on the screen. And then, hey, speaking of loving our neighbors, we've had the privilege to serve uh, Afghan refugees who live in our community. Uh, and they've been participating in English language classes, uh, but they really need our help. When we provide child care for those sessions, uh, that will help others like the Nazib Zai family, to really focus and to participate fully in those classes. So if you're interested in learning more about that opportunity and a way to serve, text the word REFUGEE to the number on the screen. All right, let's continue in worship together. Join me in standing, would you? Yeah. 
As we prepare for communion, let us be reminded again that Jesus said, let each of us examine ourselves, not our neighbor, not our friends, but ourselves, to see where we're at as we walk into this sacred place. So let us do so as we prepare for communion. Let us be reminded that each of us stand before him. We don't have a substitute in this case, but we have our own sin to be dealt with. So let us go. Let's pray. And to be reminded, Lord, that you came to set the sinners free, to pay their debt in full. But yet, those sinners came to you acknowledging their sin, acknowledging they weren't worthy acknowledging that they couldn't do it on their own. But as they searched their heart, they saw that sin that was as red as blood that couldn't be taken out except by the blood of the Lamb. So let us come before the cross, but also come before this table, realizing that table has been set for us as well. Amen. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh, oh come to
forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus said to his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover before I suffer. So aware of his suffering, he desired to have this time to share one last Passover with his disciples. So let us also share. We take the bread, the small thin wafer, symbolic of the body of our Christ. Take all of it. And after giving thanks and acknowledging that this was his body that was given for us and asking them to do it in remembrance of me, he then took the cup and he said to those around him, this cup is the new covenant. They knew about the old covenant. They knew about what God had done for Moses, what he had done for Abraham. But this was a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And it hadn't been shed yet, but he was speaking to them and to us, that it was going to be shed for each one of us so that we would have the chance to have our sins forgiven. Let us partake together. Father, you've given us this joy and you've given us this wonderful gift. May we enjoy both as we hear your word proclaimed and realize how great thou art. Amen. God's people said, amen. It is really good to be with you this morning, Trinity family. Special welcome to those of you who might be joining us for the first time as we are continuing on in our series, preparing for the promised land, as we are looking at both the story of how God led the Hebrew people into the promised land, as well as the lessons his people needed to learn on their way into the promised land, which is a great parallel for where we're living today. How many of you know this is not the promised land? Yeah, you, <laughs> this is not the promised land, but we're on our way if we're in Christ to the promised land, amen? amen? And so as we're looking at this story that's a couple thousand years old, we're not just doing it for a history lesson, we're doing it so that God's word can be applied to our lives today as we journey with Christ to the promised land that he's preparing for us. So this morning we're going to be looking together at Joshua chapter 3, if you want to turn there in your Bible. While you're turning there, let me just give you a quick review of where we are in this story. Uh, the Hebrew people, whom God is now leading into the promised land, had been slaves in Egypt for some 400 years, uh, literally shackled to a life of prison and poverty until God, in his grace, rescued them out of slavery and brought them to the very edge of the promised land. And the only barrier now between them and this promised land is the Jordan River. Of course, that's the problem. The Jordan River is between them and the promised land, which is why Joshua and the Hebrews are camped there on the edge of the Jordan River waiting for God to show them what to do next. That's where we are in the story. That's where we're going to pick up in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Here we go. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see 
the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. So Israel's leaders here are saying, don't just force your way through the river, right? We're going to find out later that this river is at flood stage. We'll get there in just a few moments. But they're saying, don't just try to force your way through the river. Keep your eyes on the Ark of the Covenant. Some of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. How many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Try to forget everything you know about Raiders of the Lost Ark as it relates to the Ark of the Covenant, right? I'm going to explain to you in a few moments what the Ark of the Covenant really was, okay, and what it represented. But basically what's going on here when the people are being told to keep your eyes on the Ark of the Covenant, what they're being told in a sense is keep your eyes on God so that you will know which way to go because as it says in verse 4, you've never been this way before, right? You're in a situation you've never found yourself in before. You've got a set of circumstances in life that you have no parallel for. Keep your eyes on God because you've never been this way before, which again is a really good word for many of us today as many of us are facing situations. Many of us are in circumstances that we've never faced before, that we've never been in before. And so we too need to be keeping our eyes on God. Okay, so the Hebrews are now at the edge of the promised land, right? The Jordan River's right in front of them. Like I said, it should also be noted that the Jordan River is at flood stage. We don't find this out till verse 15, so I'm going to skip ahead, hit verse 15, then we'll come back to the story. But notice what it says in verse 15. Now, the Jordan River, it's like this, oh, by the way, the Jordan River is at flood stage all during harvest, right? The Jordan River is at flood stage, which only heightens the sense of danger, only heightens the sense of drama that the people of Israel are now facing. Right? And since when does God ever give his people a testimony of his faithfulness without first giving them a faith-building test? Right? Let me say that again. When does God ever give his people a testimony of his faithfulness without first giving them a faith-building test? One of the things that I say to people a lot these days, and frankly, one of the things that I am preaching to myself these days, is that God doesn't give us a testimony without first taking us through a test. God doesn't give us a testimony without first taking us through a test. I know that's not in your message notes, but for some of you, maybe you want to write that down. It's something I've been preaching to myself again and again and again. I don't know anybody who doesn't want a testimony of God's faithfulness. Right? Anyone here not want a testimony of God's faithfulness? Oh, I don't even need to ask the question. You wouldn't raise your hand anyway, but right... We all want a testimony of God's faithfulness, but God takes us through a test on the way to that testimony. That's what's happening, in a sense, in the story. God is testing his people to see if they'll trust him so that he can give them a testimony of his faithfulness that will build up their faith. Right? That's why God waits till the Jordan is at flood stage to bring his people into the promised land. Well, I also want you to notice in this story uh, that the waters of the Jordan River, uh, they're not going to miraculously part like they did when Moses simply put his staff in the Red Sea and all of God's people watched the waters part while they stood safely on the shore before they crossed through the waters. You remember that story? Well, this time, it's not going to happen this, that way this time. This time, this time around, God wants his people, in a sense, to participate in the miracle. God wants his people to feel the miracle. God wants his people to experience the miracle. God wants even some of his people to get their feet wet in this miracle. Not just figuratively, like literally he wants some of his people to get their feet wet. All right, I want you to listen to how God says this miracle of parting the Jordan River is going to happen. Here we go, verse 5. Joshua told the people... Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. We're going to come back to this verse. This verse is the linchpin verse in this story. We'll come back to it. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Did I mention that the river is a flood stage? 
Verse 9, Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Now, before we look more closely at this command to the priests to step into the Jordan River, we'll get there, I first want to explain the significance of the Ark of the Covenant. The significance of the Ark of the Covenant specifically going into these floodwaters. All right? The Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of God's presence among his people. It was the physical representation that God dwelled among his people. Everywhere they went. Everywhere they went. And this idea that it was the physical representation of God's presence everywhere they went. This was a very countercultural idea to Canaanite religion because in Canaanite religion, it was believed that the gods were geographically limited. That each god had its own little specific area of authority, its own little specific area of jurisdiction. Right? So in the case of the Canaanites, they believed that the god Baal had authority over the Jordan River area. They believed that the god Baal had authority over the land of Canaan. And so by God parting the Jordan River and parking the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of that river, at flood stage no less, God was very much claiming that he was the Lord over these waters. And that therefore, he was the one who had authority over the land of Canaan. Not Baal. All right, this story, this whole story, it's about God. Right? There's some human, you know, sort of supporting cast. But this story is about God. And about how God has authority over the land of Canaan, not Baal. In fact, God is intentionally referred to here in verse 13 as the Lord of all the earth. Some translations even have it sort of set as a parenthesis. This Lord is Lord of all the earth. See, one of the questions that the book of Joshua seeks to answer is, whose land is this? Whose land is this? Is this the Lord's land or is this Baal's land? Right, I tried to take some time last week to address the elephant in the room. Like, this is a tough story. Like, God's calling people to go into an already occupied land. Does he have authority? To, who's, whose land is this? That's one of the questions. Whose land is this? Is this the Lord's land or is this Baal's land? One of the questions that would have been in the minds of both the Canaanites and the Israelites here is whether or not God really has the authority to go in and take this land. And so, in order to prove his authority... God does something very unusual here. God submits himself to a trial by water. He submits himself to a trial by water. Let me explain what I mean by a trial by water. One of the ways that people in the ancient Near East came to a verdict about someone they thought might be guilty of some crime was by forcing that person to submit to a trial by water, which meant the person being accused of doing something wrong would be cast into the river. And if the accused person drowned, that was the God's way of declaring the person was guilty. If the accused person didn't drown, that was the God's way of declaring the person not guilty. Incidentally, I know our justice system is not perfect, but I'll take our system over this one, all right? I know we got some attorneys in our midst, some folks studying law, I know our system is not perfect, but I'll take our system over this one, right? So God is about to submit himself to this trial, this trial by water in the form of his priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant into the middle of the Jordan River. Remember, it's a flood stage. And if no harm comes to the Ark, if no harm comes to God's priests who are carrying the Ark, then this will prove that God really has the authority over the Jordan River. This will prove that God really has the authority over the land of Canaan. In other words, God submits himself to this trial by water because he wants to leave no doubt 
in anyone's mind that he is the Lord and that he does indeed have authority over this land. And in fact, that he does have authority over all the earth. That he is Lord over all the earth. By the way, this trial by water is a foreshadow of another trial that God would submit himself to some 1,300 years later when Christ came to earth and submitted himself to a trial before Pontius Pilate. If you remember that story, Jesus was put on trial before Pontius Pilate for claiming that he had authority to forgive sins. For claiming that he had authority, not just over the promised land, but over heaven and earth. For claiming that he had authority to determine who could enter into God's kingdom only through him. That kind of authority, those are the kind of authority claims he made about himself. And so the religious and the political leaders, they didn't like these claims to authority that Jesus was making about himself. And so they arrested him. And they put him on trial. They put him on trial. And during that trial, Jesus is mocked. Jesus is ridiculed. Jesus is ultimately sentenced to death. Soldiers and religious leaders are yelling out to him while he's on the cross, if you're really the son of God, then save yourself. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Hours later, he dies. And his body is buried. Drowned if you will, in a tomb. At which point it seems pretty clear to everyone that the trial is over and the verdict is clear. Jesus must not be God's son. After all, Jesus was thrown into the raging river and God didn't save him. Jesus died. And once you're dead, the trial's over and the verdict is final, right? No, not so fast. Because we know three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead, overturning man's verdict. Amen? Which is why Peter proclaimed in the very first Christian sermon ever preached, God has raised this Jesus to life. Therefore, let everyone be assured of this, he says, God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. In other words, this Jesus, he made a lot of claims. He said he had authority to do a lot of things. We put him on trial. He was killed. The verdict seemed clear, but God has overturned man's verdict in order to declare that he, in fact, does have authority. That's what Lord in Christ means. He's Lord. He's in charge. He's the ruler. He's the king. Right? God waits until Jesus is dead and buried, and the trial seems to be over, and the verdict seems to be clear, and then he raises Jesus from the dead in order to do at least two things, but let me just hit two really big things. In order to both save us from our sins through his death on the cross, which is what we just celebrated in communion, and to leave no doubt that he really is Lord, that he really does have authority over all the earth, as evidenced by his resurrection. See, Christ was willing to submit himself to a trial that led to his death in order to make it known who he really was and is. He is Savior to all who trust him, and he is Lord over all. He's Lord over all the earth. Same language used here in Joshua chapter 3. And something similar is happening here in Joshua chapter 3. God submits himself to a trial by water in order to make it known to the Israelites and to the Canaanites that he is Lord over all the earth. Now, that's only one part of the story, though. It's only one angle of the story, because the ark doesn't just get into the river all by itself, right? No, God calls the priests to carry it in there. He calls 12 priests in particular to trust him enough, to take him at his word, to trust that as soon as their feet hit the water, this miracle is going to happen, right? Take a look again at verse 13. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Right? God says the miracle of the Jordan River parting, it's going to happen as soon as the priests carrying the ark of the Lord set their feet in the Jordan. Now I want you to try to imagine you're one of the priests and they're kind of prescribing, doing it by lot. I don't know exactly how they chose who gets to be a part of these, this assignment, but I'm, I'm sure everyone's looking at their feet like, okay, yeah, go ahead, Joshua, go make your, 
No one wants to make eye contact. It's like, I, I know what the assignment is. I, I, we're doing what? Right? I mean, try to imagine getting those orders from headquarters. We're going to bring the, we're, the, the rivers at flood stage, right? I mean, it's one thing to stand back, watch God part the waters of the Red Sea, then walk through the waters after you've seen the miracle. It's another thing to step into the water before the miracle happens, trusting that God's going to come through for you like he's promised. Right? I mean, this is not exactly a safe step that God is calling his people to take. If you've ever stood beside a raging river at flood stage, you know exactly what I mean. All right, if God doesn't come through as soon as his people take that step into the flood waters of the raging river, they will most certainly die. And yet that's the kind of step that God is calling his people to take here. It's not a step of faith for the faint of heart. It's just not a step of faith for the faint of heart. And friends, God's not calling us to that kind of faith. God's calling us to a risky, radical kind of faith. In fact, one of the reasons I think God calls the priests to carry the Ark into the Jordan is to confront his people's love affair with safety and comfort and to bring them to this place of radical trust in him. See, friends, God knows our tendency to organize our lives around safety and around comfort. And so here, God calls his people to this dangerous assignment that will test their faith and deepen their trust. Right? I mean, he calls them to take this step that's going to make their palms sweat and their hearts beat faster. Because that's the kind of God we serve. It just... I'm trying to tell you the truth this morning, friends. That's the kind of God we serve. He's not primarily interested in our safety or our comfort. Right? And I'm not trying to paint some picture of an uncaring God. I'm just saying he's not primarily interested in our safety or our comfort. I followed him for enough decades to know that's not what he's primarily reaching for in my life. I've been a pastor long enough, walked beside enough people to know that's not primarily what God is interested in. His arm is not, his arm is not too short to reach, to eliminate pain. He could do it in a second, and sometimes he does, which is why it gets confusing for us. Because we think, we, well, he can. Why doesn't he? Because he's not primarily concerned with the elimination of pain. He's just not. I've only been a pastor here two years, celebrated my two-year anniversary last week. I don't know all of you, but I've walked beside enough of you to know some of you are navigating deep, deep pain. God's arm's not too short to reach, but it doesn't mean that because he's not eliminating the pain that he's not with you. What I'm trying to say this morning is his primary concern, his primary concern is not your safety and your comfort. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. It's a good thing I'm not doing church, children's church here because what I'm not saying is, I'm not saying that God is opposed to seatbelts, safety locks, ibuprofen, right, or sleeping on comfortable mattresses, right? So don't, don't misunderstand me this morning. I'm just saying that God is reaching for something deeper. He's reaching for something deeper. He's reaching for something that requires us to be willing to risk our comfort in order to commit to whatever he calls us to. Some of you know that over the years, our family has been very involved in the ministry of Sister Connection, uh, which is an organization that serves widows and orphans uh, in war-torn Burundi. It's a little country in East Africa. Our whole family actually lived and served in rural East Africa for several months back in 2014 when I was helping to relaunch a pastoral training school there. Uh, and it was a very stretching, faith-building, out-of-our-comfort-zone step for all six of us. I've also had the privilege of taking several other trips to Burundi, sometimes there uh, on my own, sometimes with other folks from local churches here in the States in order to teach, in order to encourage, in order to come alongside some of the Burundian leadership. And, and while the Burundian leaders, they're always so kind to express their gratitude to me, I got to say something. I am the one who has been inspired by them. I'm the one who's been inspired by them because they are the modern-day priests of Joshua 3 
stepping out into the Jordan River at flood stage. I could give you lots of examples. Let me just give you one. I remember before one trip to Burundi, I was feeling somewhat discouraged because there were some things going on in my life and in my ministry that weren't going the way I wanted them to be going. Some things that were more difficult than I wanted them to be, such that I was getting frustrated. I was getting disappointed. I was a bit discouraged because of the pain I was experiencing. I wasn't in full-blown self-pity mode. But leading up to that trip, I could sense that my perspective was becoming very self-centered, that my perspective was becoming very self-oriented around my desire for ease, my desire for a smooth sailing life. How many of you like a smooth sailing life? Nothing wrong with wanting a smooth sailing life, but I was becoming self-centered around my desire for a smooth sailing life. And so one of my prayers going into that trip to Burundi was that God would renew in me this kingdom perspective that I needed to have so that I could come back and be faithful to the assignments that he called me to, regardless of whether or not things went the way I wanted them to, regardless of whether or not things were as smooth sailing and pain-free as I wanted them to be. And God answered my prayer by leading me into a conversation with a man named Astaire who served as a pastor in a local church in Burundi. Esther was an incredibly gifted and godly man and one of the key leaders in the church in Burundi. I met Pastor Esther in the district of Kabuye as our team was sharing lunch with him and some of the other church leaders in that region. And uh, so soon after we sat down together at table, I discovered that he could speak English fairly well. Uh, I only knew about nine words in Kurundi, so it was going to be a conversation that was going to happen in English. And so I just said, hey, would you tell me some of your story? Here's what he told me. Astaire grew up in Burundi, where as a young man, he sensed God calling him into pastoral ministry. And so he traveled to Rwanda, the country just to the north of Burundi, where he studied theology, because there wasn't an opportunity for him to study theology there in Burundi at that time. And so he lived there in Rwanda until the genocide began in 1993. Some of you know exactly what I mean when I say the genocide in Rwanda in 1993. The Hutus, the Tutsis, right? War breaks out in 1993, at which point Astaire has to flee for his life to Kenya, where he finishes up his pastoral studies and he plants a church there in Kenya. And Esther ministered there in Kenya for several years, pastoring a church, beginning a family, until the year 2000, when he sensed God calling him to go back into Burundi. Now, you need to understand something about that year 2000, right? Whereas things had settled down in Rwanda, in the year 2000, the war in Burundi was still in full swing. People were trying to get out of Burundi, right? But Esther sensed God calling him to go into Burundi. And when Esther heard that call to step into that raging river, he obeyed God. He obeyed God. In fact, for the first three years of his ministry in Burundi, Pastor Esther shepherded the church through murder, massacre, and danger. Esther told me how he would frequently walk past dead bodies on his way to and from church. In many cases, the dead bodies of his own flock. And as I sat there listening to Esther share his story, telling me about the challenges that he faced in his life and in his ministry, let's just say it was God's way of answering my prayer for perspective about my life and my ministry. I mean, when is the last time I had to flee for my life? When is the last time I had to shepherd the church through murder and massacre? Right? Listening to Esther share his story was... God's way of answering my prayer for kingdom perspective. See, in order for me to not get stuck pining away for smooth sailing instead of raging rivers, I needed to sit next to someone like Pastor Astaire. I needed to sit next to someone, this real flesh and blood, modern day example of these priests in Joshua 3 who stepped into the raging river trusting God with their very lives. Right? I mean, I was humbled listening to this man whose life had been marked by tears and tests. And I use both of those words very intentionally. His life was marked by tears and tests. But the highlight for me 
in that lunchtime conversation was the testimony Astaire shared with me at the end of our conversation. Astaire told me with this gleam in his eye about how in recent years, many people in Burundi were coming to faith in Christ. He talked about how there's this spiritual revival that's now taking place in Burundi. Right? His life marked by tears and tests. But then he tells me this glorious testimony. And I could tell as I was looking into his eyes that the suffering, that the danger, that even the death that marked so many of the early years of his ministry in Burundi were worth it to be a part of the spiritual revival that was happening there in his homeland. Again, it was one of those moments where God reminded me that the advancement of his kingdom does not happen through the faint of heart. It just doesn't. The advancement of God's kingdom does not happen through those who organize their lives around safety and comfort. No, the advancement of the kingdom, it happens through those who are willing to go all in in following Christ. Even if it means following him right into the realm of risk and danger. Because friends, that's where miracles happen. As you've been hearing me say all throughout this series, quoting Erwin McManus who says, We all want miracles. We all want miracles, but we avoid the context where miracles happen. Folks, miracles happen when we're willing to go all in with Jesus and live our lives with holy abandon to God, doing whatever he calls us to. Even if it leads to risk. Even if it leads to danger. Even if it leads to some measure of inconvenience or insecurity. Even if it leads to less money or more pain. See, folks, our job, let me just lay it out for you real simply. Our job is simply to trust God. God's job is to do amazing things, which is why Joshua tells the people back in verse 5. I told you we'd get back to verse 5. Joshua tells the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Right? Our job is simply to trust and obey. God's job is to do amazing things. And by the way, consecrate, you're like, what's consecrate? Consecrate yourselves. This is simply a theological term that means get rid of whatever's holding you back so that you can go all in with God, so that you can devote yourself, your whole life, to God and his purposes. Right? Joshua says when you do that, when you consecrate yourselves, Joshua says, when you're willing to live your life with that kind of holy abandon to God, Joshua says when you're willing to trust, trust God enough, to do whatever he calls you to do without holding on to safety or security, Joshua says, that's when amazing things are going to happen. That's when miracles are going to happen. He says, tomorrow the Lord's going to do amazing things among you. Today, consecrate yourself. Tomorrow, God's going to do amazing things. Right? These priests who were called to step into the Jordan River while it was at flood stage, they didn't avoid the context where miracles happen. Right? They they trusted God. They stepped out in obedience to what God called them to. And when they took that first step, boy, I would have loved to have seen the look on their face. Can you imagine? When they took that first step, they experienced exactly, precisely what God promised would happen in verse 5. Amazing things. Look at verse 14 as we wrap up this story. Here it is. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet... As soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. You talk about an experience of God's miraculous provision. And again, let me just restate it. The reason they experienced this miracle is because they took to heart what Joshua said to them the day before. When he called them to consecrate themselves when he called them to surrender themselves completely to God. Some of you know that our family has had numerous stories of God's miraculous 
provision over our 25 plus years of ministry. I share anecdotally at times in my messages just to sort of illustrate. I hope it doesn't sound pharisaical. My intention is to give God the glory. We've got lots of stories of God's miraculous provision. Lots of stories of God doing amazing things. Providing for us. Helping us in amazing ways. But almost every one of these amazing stories... Almost every one of these amazing stories of God's help, almost every one of these amazing stories of God's provision was preceded by God calling us to consecrate ourselves to him. God calling us to surrender ourselves anew to him. God calling us to yield ourselves and trust him because that's how God works, friends. Let me lay it out for you simply again. Our job is simply to trust and surrender to God. God's job, Joshua says, is to do amazing things among us. And so that's the invitation this morning. To trust God and to surrender yourself to him and then to be ready and willing to step into whatever raging river he might call you to. And again, let me be really clear here. I'm not talking about going out looking for something dangerous to do like skydiving without a parachute, okay? Don't, how many of you know there's a difference between courageous obedience and stupidity? Right? That's why the book of Proverbs is right in the middle of our Bible. There's a lot in there about that. No, friends, I'm simply talking about being willing to do whatever God is calling you to do or to be willing to do whatever God might call you to do. See, God wants to do amazing things in your life. But there's a step that comes first. Consecrate yourselves. Trust Him enough to step into whatever raging river He's calling you to step into. In fact, that's the first question I want to ask you this morning as it relates to a next step in response to God's word. Is there a specific step that God is calling you to take today? A specific step that you know as soon as I ask that question, it's already coming to your mind. Maybe it's in your relational world. Maybe there's a relationship that you know needs some time. And you today just need to commit to God that you're going to give the necessary time to it. Maybe it's with him. Maybe it's with another person. Or maybe the next step you need to take is in your financial world. Maybe God is calling you to trust him enough to start giving, even though you're afraid of what taking that step might mean to your bottom line, especially now that we're living in some days where the economy is a little volatile, shall we say. Or maybe the next step that you need to take is in your vocational world, your job world, even though on paper it now just doesn't seem the right time to be thinking about taking that kind of next step. Or maybe your next step is to share your faith with someone in your sphere of influence. Doing that for some of you feels like stepping into a raging river, like, "Ah, I don't know if I want to have that conversation with that person. Folks, a lot of people in our culture right now will not darken the door of a church. I get that. But many of them are open to watching spiritual stuff online. Right? Maybe your next step is to send them a link to this teaching series. Right? Full transparency, I'll just say it like it is. We got a lot of people, some of you are in this room, whose introduction to Trinity was by way of watching us online. Maybe your next step is simply to send someone a link to this series just with a simple note that just to say, I'm thinking about you. I don't know what you'll think about this, but this this was helpful for me. Or maybe God wants to say something to you. People in our culture, a lot of people, they're not going to darken the door of a church. I get that. But a lot of those same people will watch spiritual stuff online. Maybe your next step is to send them a link to this series. Or maybe your next step is to serve somewhere at Trinity. Again, for some of you, that feels like stepping into a raging river. You're like, I don't know if I have any gifts. What if I get stuck on some team and they make me serve there until I die or Jesus comes back? Like, <laughs> right? Like, I get that. There are churches for whom that's the pattern. All right? That's not how we work around here. Right? If you've had this sense of like, I got I to gotta get in somewhere. I got to put my oar in the water, no pun intended. Right? There's a way to do that. Sign up at the bottom of your message notes. It just says, I, I wanna, I'm interested. I want to have a conversation. It's a low-key conversation, all right? It's not a timeshare conversation, <laughs> all right? You don't have to sign in blood. 
right? It's just a conversation. But for some of you, like, that's the sense that you've got this sense of, like, I think I'm supposed to step in and serve somewhere, but it feels like, it feels like stepping into a raging river. Or maybe your next step is to acknowledge that you haven't yet gotten baptized and publicly declared your faith in Christ in that particular way. And let me say again, we won't even make you do that in a raging river, right? In fact, Tom usually makes the water kind of warm. It's like a jacuzzi. But for some of you, it's like stepping into the raging river because you're like, ah, in front of people, like, I don't know if I want to take that step. Some of you haven't taken that step yet, and you need to take that step. Or for some of you, your next step is to acknowledge an addiction or a habit that's eating your lunch and to just say, I need some help. You know, just note that on that prayer request section where the staff looks at it. We'll help you. We'll get you pointed in the right direction. I'm not a trained counselor, but we have a wonderful relationship with some trained counselors in our area who are helping some of our people. So maybe that's your next step. Or maybe your next step is to simply let someone on our, our prayer team pray for you by writing out your prayer request on the tear-off. For some of you, you're like, I don't like to be that transparent. I don't like to show that much of what's going on in my life. But, but God calls us to pray for each other, to bear each other's burdens. And for some of you, that's, that feels a little bit like stepping into a raging river, but maybe that's your next step to just get that prayer request section out and let us know how we can pray for you. Or maybe the next step God is calling you to take this morning is the step of surrendering your life to Christ and receiving the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're ready to take that step, I would just encourage you right where you are. You can do it right where you are, from your heart. Simply call out to God. Acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge that you need a Savior. Call on Jesus to be that Savior. And then surrender to Him. Let Him be Lord and leader of your life, calling the shots in your life from here on out. And then I'd encourage you to declare that next step on your tear-off section of the message notes so that we can pray for you and so that we can then encourage you and get you connected with resources that will help you on this journey. Maybe, maybe there's a specific next step that God's calling you to take and you know it today. But I got one more next step for those of you who are not in that category because I had this thought this week that for some, I don't know if there is a specific step that you sense God calling you to take today. But maybe today is about committing to take whatever step God shows you to take in the future. To consecrate yourself to God today in preparation for the amazing things that God wants to do tomorrow or the next day or the day after that that you might not even know about. In other words, maybe today is about consecrating yourself to God, committing yourself to God, so that whatever next step God calls you to take, whenever God might call you to take it, you're all in now. You're ready and willing to take it if and when he calls you to it. Right, Trinity family, God wants to do amazing things in and among us. Right, maybe in our lives, maybe in our families, maybe in our finances, maybe in our South Bend community, but there's a step we need to take that precedes it. Consecrate yourself Today, Joshua says to the people in verse 5, consecrate yourself, surrender yourself to God today, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So let's consecrate ourselves to him now, or let's re-consecrate ourselves to him now. Let's take whatever next steps he's calling us to take. If there's a specific step that he's put on your heart right now, then you need to take it. Commit to taking it. Or maybe today is simply about, Lord, I'm all in. I don't even know if I got a specific next step, but I'm all in and I'm ready if and when you give me one. Let's pray as the worship team comes. Father, thank you again for what you've done for us in Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for stepping into the raging river of our sin when you were worthy. You were perfect. You didn't have to do any of that. And yet you did that for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I would pray by your spirit that you would continue to do that work of opening our eyes to the good news of who you are as king and what you were willing to do to save us so that we trust you in those places where you call us to take steps that don't feel safe or secure. Because if you were willing to endure the cross on our behalf, how can we not trust you with these lesser crosses that you might call us to? So, Lord, I would just pray 
all across the room, wherever you're speaking to hearts, if you put your finger on a specific thing that you're calling us to, just give us now the courage to commit to taking it. And then, Lord, there are others of us who maybe we're just open before you. We're surrendered. We don't, we don't have a specific step that we sense you calling us to take, but we just, in this moment, we reconsecrate ourselves to you. We ready ourselves so that we are at your pleasure, willing and ready to serve however you want us to, so that you might do the amazing things among us, so that the people who look in on our lives ultimately hear a testimony from us of your great faithfulness. In Jesus' name, and everyone agreed and said, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship our great King. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I
yet not I, but through Christ in me. And here's the benediction from Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.